Welcome to the Attention Deficit Disorder Expert Podcast Series by Attitude Magazine. Welcome to Mental Health Out Loud, a new type of conversation where the editors of Attitude talk with leading experts in the fields of ADHD and mental health about the topics of greatest concern. Today, we're talking about eating disorders, and we have an esteemed expert to help us understand what defines an eating disorder, how can we know if our children are secretly suffering with eating disorders, what are the underlying causes of eating disorders, and so much more. We are asking our expert, Dina Cabrera, the very questions that our readers have asked to get help for families right now. Dina is a clinical psychologist and certified eating disorder specialist with over 24 years of experience. She has a private practice in Anthem, Arizona, and she has previously served as president of the International Association of Eating Disorders Professionals. Before we start our conversation, I have just a few housekeeping items. Those of you tuned in to this live event may submit questions for Dina at any time by navigating to the text box under the video player. We will do our best to incorporate your questions into today's conversation. And if you support the work we're doing here at Attitude, we encourage you to visit attitudemag.com slash subscribe and sign up for Attitude Magazine. Subscribe now and you will receive our just published winter issue featuring a holiday survival guide, a survey that our readers answered on kids' mental health, a feature on new digital therapies aimed at curbing ADHD symptoms, and more. So welcome, Dina, and thank you for joining Attitude for this very important conversation on eating disorders. This might come as a surprise to many of our listeners, but eating disorders are not a behavioral issue. They're considered a mental illness, and girls with ADHD are particularly vulnerable. One study found that girls with ADHD were almost four times more likely to have an eating disorder than those without ADHD. So let's begin with the basics. What are the different types of common eating disorders and how do these present differently in boys and girls? Well, thank you, Carol. I appreciate um, being here and talking about this very important uh, topic, Um, something that I'm very passionate about because it is true that eating disorders are a serious mental health issue and they are really the second leading cause of death, only second, I mean, only to opioid overdose. Um, Not too long ago, it was actually the first leading cause of death. So it's important to understand that they're very complex and they're very serious in the sense that they are mental health issues. And they do range from what we will consider disordered eating to eating disorder. An eating disorder characterized by certain criteria would involve like anorexia. So those who have difficulties sustaining enough energy um, for what their body needs So restricting a lot of their food, significant body image issues, fear of fat. Then we have those with bulimia uh, who will compensate for their food intake. So they may binge a lot of food in a short amount of time and then will compensate either through abuse uh, such as uh, exercise or self-induced vomiting. Um, There's other ways as well. such as laxative abuse. And then we have those with binge eating disorder, those who don't necessarily will compensate, but they'll they'll eat a lot of food in a short amount of time. That's a loss of control, a lot of shame and embarrassment. So there might be a lot of secret eating. And then we have this other classified area called what we call ARFID. And these are the kids, could be adults too, that don't necessarily have body image issues or fear of weight gain or fat or that psychological um, issue to diet because they want to look different. It would be those kids who are avoidant of food because of textures or they, they are afraid they may throw up or they're not interested. They're just not interested in food. They don't have an appetite. And we see a lot of those, um, adults and kids as well with ADHD and this, and we'll talk later about perhaps what stimulants can 
um, in how stimulants can influence some of that lack of appetite. So you mentioned disordered eating. How does mm-hmm. an eating disorder differ from disordered eating? And is there a typical age of onset for either of these? Yes. Well, and there's various times through the developmental stages that were more triggered or or individuals are more triggered for an eating disorder or disordered eating. And as you would imagine, it would be these transitional times. So 12 to 13, we're seeing again, you know, and it's actually getting younger. We're seeing it again around 17, 18, you know, perhaps motherhood or adulthood and then later in years. So there are various times of triggered onset. Um, But honestly, I've seen kids younger and younger have eating disorders. I have an eight-year-old right now that I'm treating who is struggling with a lot of dysregulation with um, eating. Uh, So difficulties being satiated, constantly thinking about food, uh, mentally, you know, upset and and challenged with the way she looks. So there's various degrees. Disordered eating may not fit a criteria in the, what we classify as the DSM for, you know, um, diagnosing eating disorders, but it's still just as mentally challenging because there's a lot of difficulties with esteem, you know, self-worth, um, wanting to use food to change the way they look or avoiding food or using food to cope. So nobody sometimes sees that on the inside, the, the mental torture that they go through of thinking about food or hating themselves or wanting to um, uh uh, hide food and then eat it secretly. So a lot of things we may not see, but they're still just as dangerous and still psychological toll. So, yeah. So that brings me to um, the next question, which is what are the warning signs um, of an, uh, in the very beginning of an eating disorder that a parent or a teacher might overlook? <clears throat> yes. So the first thing that I always tell, you know, particularly teachers or, you know, adults is we'll see, you know, perhaps mood changes. Um, you know, you might see that they're, they're either more anxious or they're depressed or they have a change behaviorally, like in their homework. All of a sudden they were doing pretty well. And then all of a sudden you'll see a drop. Um, in their their functioning at school, or they become more isolative. So those types of mood changes or behavior changes we might start to see first. Now that could uh, attribute to a lot of different things, right? So then you start to look at, well, are there specific adherences to food or exercise schedules? Are are they making excuses to, to not eat? Are they, are you finding wrappers or food that has been secretly eating? So those are some more eating disorder behaviors, rules and flexible thinking. See a lot of inflexible thinking about food um, and dieting. Uh, and one of the main factors or um, con- uh, consistent factors that we see that influence eating disorders is that first that first diet they go on. You know, it's the dieting behaviors, the wanting to lose weight, uh, and then getting reinforced and rewarded for perhaps losing weight. Um, but then it gets to, it takes it to the extreme. So these are some 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 little things that you can look for. Um, and certainly sometimes the best way parents can pick it up is um, by asking, you know, how do you feel about, you know, where you are? Um, are you balanced? Are you eating a variety of food? And we can get to that in just a little bit too. Um, how can care, caregivers know if decreased eating is due to stimulants, which as you know, can act as an appetite suppressant or mm-hmm. if due to a, an eating disorder? And quite a few people have asked, can stimulant use lead to an eating disorder? Yes. And this is probably the hardest question to answer because it's yes and no, because I really feel, um, as many of you know, who understand uh, and deal with ADHD every day, the medication can be extremely helpful, you know, to bring down those regulatory systems, give them the dopamine that they need and, you know, kind of 
even them out a little bit because the dopamine receptors, and this is a complex, you know, system, right? Um, one of the things that they need is um, to regulate and often food can be a regulator. So I say yes, and because for those who are really struggling with significant weight issues and they need restoration, um, we have to look at medical and nutritional stability first and make sure that they're in an appropriate weight. Um, now, if you, if you layer that on overlaps with ADHD, we want to be careful with using stimulants with somebody who's underweight and malnourished and has difficulties eating because of lack of appetite. With that being said, you know, if we're treating them simultaneously, we have to work with those um, difficulties with hunger and fullness cues um, and they need the stimulant. We have to be able to work and be able to give them what they need despite hunger and fullness cues. So it gets a little complicated. So I'm very much for treating the ADHD if appropriate for the individual with stimulant medication or to try a non-stimulant. And there's some other options as well. Um, but we have to be careful about the weight and where the person is medically and nutritionally before we jump to a stimulant. Later in their treatment, if we are treating an eating disorder, I very much think that a stimulant might be needed. And we have to work with, with the individual on hunger fullness cues getting the nutrition that they need despite hunger and being able to regulate their systems. So it gets a little complicated as, as I see, but I definitely think that you have to get somebody that understands ADHD and understands the eating disorder because working with those two together, and especially if it involves a stimulant, is very important mm -hmm. um, to modulate, mod moderate that, modulate that. So what drives eating disorders in teens and adolescents with ADHD? Is it about control? Is it about low self-esteem, body image? Or in the case of bulimia and binge eating, it, does it have to do with ADHD's weak self-regulation and impulsivity? Can you talk a little <laughs> bit about those? Sure. I think it's like all of the above, right? So they are, you know, eating disorders are definitely... Um, there's a strong inheritance, you know, for it's a strong inherited predisposition uh, in terms of a biologically based neurophysiological disorder. Um, they do tend to run in families, but it doesn't mean like your mom or dad had an eating disorder it could be, you know, through, you know, genetically. Um, so that contributes to roughly 56, you know, 60% of the risk factor for an eating disorder. And then you have the other 40, you know, 50% that is environmentally fluenced. And we're definitely in a culture that believes that thinner is better. It's very much about appearance ideal. Um, it definitely can definitely relate to low self-esteem and poor self-worth and the, how we equate that, you know, with if I'm just thin, then everything will be okay. So, there is also a lot of focus on, you know, what healthy is and, you know, certain, the, you know, that, that visual that we have of what we constitute as healthy. And that's very confusing out in our culture, especially with all the food messages. And then we also are very judgmental. So there's a lot of comparison about, you know, and that's where the perfectionism comes in and, you know, wanting to be, you know, a be approved by people wanting to be liked. So I think all of that complicates um, the, the, you know, the drive for an eating disorder. And it really sets somebody up, um, particularly if they have any kind of depression or anxiety, oftentimes they turn to their bodies as wanting to fix that and then everything would be okay. So it gets really complicated in that sense. Mm -hmm. Oh, I wanted to mention, sorry. Yes. I wanted to mention, you said something about, you know, related to ADHD. Um, yes, yes. There's, you know, the whole, 
the theory of the habit, right? The dopamine reward, the cravings. You know, if you've ever studied the the neural system <laughs> of food and that process, it, it it's absolutely you know mind boggling. So there's a lot of reward processing and learning and memory um, and the endocrine, the gut brain. So there's a lot that's involved. And food happens to be a way to deal with a lot of the, the, the symptoms or difficulties with ADHD. Um, you know, it could be a regulator. It could be something to do when I'm bored. It could be, um, it's the, the craving process, right? Of, you know, giving, getting something. And sometimes it's just the getting it. Um, I'm not sure they like it, but they, they want it and they seek it. And that could be part of the ADHD system. So it tends to be an imbalance in all of that. And food happens to be something that they turn to, to help soothe them. And in, I don't know if it necessarily relaxes them, but it certainly gives them something to focus on. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, it's a it's a delicate balance in dealing with all of those different systems that are going on. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so how how can caregivers and teachers identify and best address these underlying issues? And what are reasonable and appropriate supports at school for students with an eating disorder? That that's great. Um, yeah, that, that's a great, and there's lots of resources, and I can mention that. One that I'm uh, starting to work with right now is called Be Real, and they're actually going into schools and, and talking to parents as well. Uh, but the first thing is we've got we've to gotta shift this culture. The culture of thinner is better, more is better, you know, uh, being popular is better. We, we have to really get a shift to being your own unique self. And I know that sounds cliche, but we have to almost in the home uh, get focused back on who their integrity, who they are, you know, uh, where their values are, who they are as people, and really get back to unique, healthy, balanced self and attend to physical and mental health, not just... Um, academic or intellectual or performance, uh, really getting back to that regulation. I think the other cultural shift is instead of focusing on weight and measurement and, uh, you know, our bodies as an ornament, we get focused back on our bodies as an instrument, uh, who, who we are is more important as a person than necessarily what we look like. I mean, it's, it's great to decorate ourselves in a sense, but we also want to focus on what's really important. So that's another cultural shift. And then the other cultural shift would be not judging people by appearance, being careful of the way we talk about our own bodies, the way we talk about our food lifestyle. I, I, I knew a teacher that was all, um, was, you know, glorifying and glamorizing her plant diet. And it was sending a message to the kids about, well, wow, that's, that's really valued and that's really glamorized. And maybe I need to do that too. They're very impressionable at this age. So we need to focus more about accepting people at all sizes and shapes and being more about our integrity and who we are as people. Um, so it's a big cultural shift. Uh, in, in, in all of those. And that's what we can start with by not talking negatively about ourselves, not judging other people about their bodies, not saying comments like, oh my gosh, you lost 20 pounds. You look so good. Keep it off of our bodies. You know, talk about, yeah, I love your spirit and your smile. And well, I guess that's their bodies too, but the energy, your laugh, things that are more complimentary about them as people than about what they look like. You know, mm -hmm. and that's all that's, you know, I love, sure. I love to wear earrings and dress in pretty sweaters or what have you, but we don't want to continually focus on that. Um, we want it to make about balance um, instead of weight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we have quite a few questions from listeners regarding treatment. Um, sure. And we touched on this a little bit. Um, so the first question is, is it necessary to treat a child's ADHD first before treating the eating disorder? And 
is stimulant medication safe to use when a person has an eating disorder? And I know you talked about, if you yes. could talk about that a little bit more. Sure, sure. So they both need to be addressed at the same time. That's hard to do because there's um, a, not a lot. I mean, we're in the infancy of un- really understanding and having research with eating disorders. And we're in the very, very infancy of eating disorders and ADHD. So we don't know a lot about it. But like you said, we do know that about four times um, in ADHD, you're four times as likely to have an eating disorder. So they definitely correlate, particularly with binge eating and bulimia. Um, so think about that under controlled presentation, right? And there, and food may be a, a way to regulate in, in, in a complicated way. But yes, you have to treat them both at the same time. Uh, and I, I definitely, and, and some people will disagree with me that I really believe if you understand the, the ADHD, that sometimes stimulant medication may be necessary, but that doesn't mean that there's another other sources of support. There's, um, there's ways to help the child or the adult regulate, you know, there's strategies and interventions that we need to put in place. So I definitely don't think that it's just a psychotropic um, medication. And then, you know, as you all know, then it's done. We have to really teach them about, um, this gets tricky, structure and support around food, but yet being careful not to create a, a feeling of being on a diet um, and being restricted because then that evokes the food deprivation, right? So it's a big balance of, I want to give support and I want to give guidance around meal plans and having consistency, three meals a day, you know, two or three snacks a day, um, and having some structure. Of course, you know, we want the body to move. We want it, you know, stress management, you know, we want good sleep. All of those systems need to be in balance. Uh, And then we need to look at, okay, how does the medication fit with all this um, in keeping that structure and that consistency? But yes, they need to be treated at the same time. If they're malnourished, we need to be careful with the stimulant medication because we need to make sure that they're in a... um, in a medically and nutritionally safe place. Mm-hmm. So that's a long answer to, <laughs> it's, it's complicated. So, but the right person and the right team can help manage both of those. Mm-hmm. When yeah. would it be considered unsafe to use stimulants in a person with an eating disorder? And in that case, what alternatives might be considered? Well, when it's unsafe, it's when their weight is really compromised. And so they're nutritionally, so medically and nutritionally, they're very compromised. Um, I think that, uh, and there's heart rate issues, there's you know, blood pressure labs are off. So they're definitely, we have medical, um, medical evidence to show that we really need to get this, the, their weight and restoration and get them at a better place. Um, I think those with, uh, if they're abusing, obviously the stimulant for weight loss, because that can be done as well. Um, so I'm just going to take this and so that I can restrict and lose weight. I definitely think that's an issue. And so we have to look at the intention behind those with, um, eating disorders on using stimulants. Uh, and, and that can be tough because you really got to get to, you know, what are you really using this and are you eating um, regularly slash normally throughout the day and consistently. So that could be an issue that they can't abuse it. Um, and the other thing is, is do you we have a really good history and timeline that they truly have ADHD um, and they're not just using it for uh, abuse. So those are some things to look for. But I'm also on the other side of, you know, I, I know what it's like to have ADHD and um, and I know how that can impact their um, their their uh, approach toward food and their abuse of food uh, or their restriction of food. So it has to be delicately balanced. Um, you know, my son, uh, I'll be very candid, he was on Vivance for many years. And then all of a sudden, um, his and his hunger fullness cues were impacted um, and he didn't like it. He did not like being hungry all day at a really hard time eating during lunch, 
eating his snacks. So he would go all day. And we we talked and talked and talked about how that's not healthy. He's not feeding his brain, um, certainly, obviously, his body. But it and so he had decided to go off of it and get his hunger and fullness cues back because he really he really wanted that. Someone with an eating disorder may not want that. You know, they like to be, they, it does help them lose weight. So we have to be careful about the intention behind using it. So he, he got off of it and, and he's been able to do some other strategic skills, um, find out, you know, of course he's older now, so it's been helpful to balance out his eating, but it took some time and use other compensatory skills and strategies to deal with the ADHD. He's also not in school anymore, so that's helpful. <laughs> so, but he, that was his choice and that's what he wanted to do, but it was a challenge. So that brings up an interesting point. Um, how, how, um, what, how, how, how does it differ between girls and boys when it comes to eating disorders and knowing when you're hungry or not hungry or the motivation to look well? I mean, do, are boys impacted in the same way? Maybe you could talk a little bit about that because we sure. usually do this in terms of girls and not necessarily boys. Sure. Um, and we're seeing uh, a lot of boys. Um, I have many boys in, um, um, in treatment, you know, dealing with eating disorders and difficulties with um, uh, food just in general, like that ARFID category I was talking about. Um, and so, so the re- so it's interesting. The research shows that boys um, have a more focus, and this this is true, to be bigger and muscular, but yet that pressure to be leaner. So there definitely could be more emphasis on um, I've got to be big and strong, but I also have to be cut um, and lean. And so we get those uh, those that that pressure to to look. Um, bigger, but not have any fat on them. So that gets a little tricky um, with boys. And there also tends to be more um, texture. Like there could be more correlation with the ARFID part with the boys. Um, There also tends to be an interesting, uh, some research that shows that boys are more impacted by bullying as it relates to their weight. Not that girls aren't, but they, they are very impacted if there's bullying about weight, which tends to be oftentimes still accepted in schools. Like you, can, you can't bully about, well, not that they, they don't, but bully about like race or but, but when it comes to weight, it doesn't seem to be as monitored. But just side note, um, but boys, I'll tell you, in our inpatient residential unit at Rosewood, the boys are present. The males are presenting very much like those with girls. Uh, sometimes there's very little difference, and I think that's the stigma uh, that boys face. They have a significant stigma that boys do not, or males do not, get eating disorders. And I'm telling you, in our inpatient residential unit, they're very much struggling with the same type of issues, which is perfectionism, low self-esteem, body image issues, significantly you know, hating their bodies, hating what they look like, not feeling good enough inside, um, and definitely a lot of food rules. So I have several boys that other than gender, you would not be able to tell the difference because they're dealing with the same underlying issues. Um, And I think that's really important to, you know, uh, for people to know that there's, there is some differences You know, there might be a focus on bigger muscle and there could be a whole body dysmorphia related to big, big orexia is what they call it. Um, But oftentimes there's not any difference. And I think that we need to recognize those, those issues, the weight stigma, the Mm -hmm. stigma in general is related to eating disorders and who gets them. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. um, This question is about recovery. Um, how can parents try to ensure that a teen's recovery from an eating disorder will, will last? Um, and maybe I should actually preface this by saying first, what, how do you know when a, when a teen or a young adult needs professional help? Um, and then okay. how to ensure when they do get that help that the recovery will last? 
That's a great question. Um, I think, you know, when definitely their function is impacted, right? School, social, academics, mood, you often will see a mood. Um, from a, a growth chart perspective, it's when, you know, if, if they're trending along in their growth chop, chart and their percentile, you'll see a blip up or down. So you see either a drop or you'll see, an, you know, they go up and they're, because particularly we're supposed to be kind of following this growth curve, if you will. So you might see a variation, you know, significant variation in that, a different, uh, see different mood. And so, or they're isolating and it's impacting their social health and their academic health. That's when you definitely need help. Um, because, you know, with a, with a, somebody who understands eating disorders, somebody who understands nutrition, we can get them back into a consistent, um, you know, uh, be, uh, relationship with food, a healthy relationship with food, but also <clears throat> dealing with the skills that they need, they need to regulate, being emotionally aware, self-compassion, inner values, connecting back to that, um, and definitely helping them with social uh, interpersonal skills. A lot of kids these days, and we'll maybe talk a little bit about social media, have a real difficult time. Um, and there are really a lot of influences of social media, but I would definitely say getting them into treatment, the sooner the better. Even if you're just like, eh, it's a phase. It, it's like I said, the eating disorders are serious. Disordered eating is mentally torturing. Um, and so getting them some help sooner the better uh, is the recommendation. Even if it's just an evaluation, you think, you know, I don't think this is too bad, but let me go get them evaluated because I want to make sure because eating disorders are so serious. Um, so that's kind of where I would start. And in terms of long-term recovery, I, I think when we see those, those three aspects, biologically, they're doing better, you know, they're, they're where they need to be in terms of, um, they're, they're perhaps their, I don't want to say weight because I just don't want to judge it on weight or numbers, but I want to judge it on behavior patterns with food. Um, I want to say that they're moving their bodies, that socially they're doing a little bit better and certainly academic. They're back to what they love to do. Um, recovery is, 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 can be a long-term thing. It, it could be, you know, a process. It could be two to three years, but when you see them back engaging in their life, that's when you start to know that they're getting better and they're being consistent in their nutritional, with their nutritional needs. I had a, um, I'll just tell a real quick story. Um, you know, I, I've, I've had hundreds of patients, but one particular patient, um, I knew she was getting better when she started telling me all the drama that was happening at school and what she was doing on the weekends and, you know, how she was going to go to this, you know, fall festival and uh, this thing. And I knew that when she started to talk about other things in her life, other than food, weight, and shape, that she was starting to re-engage. And those are some um, really significant indicators. They're re-engaging again. Yeah. So, so it's safe to assume that males and females aren't really engaging when they're suffering with eating disorders. Does that mean they're mostly at home um, and not socializing because they don't feel great about themselves? And then possibly, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, wow. definitely, they're not engaging. They're not, or they're, or they're going through the motions. Mm -hmm. You know, they're going through the motions and. Um, but yes, I, I typically see a, uh, a move toward, you know, isolation, uh, avoidance. Um, and that is, you know, a lot of indicative of the shame and pain that they're feeling. Um, I, I mean, you will have a few that will are engaging, but when you really talk to them and you, you really kind of get that sense, they, they'll tell you, I feel disconnected. You know, I feel in my head all the time. Um, and they're just, they're just not, they're just not in the moment. And they just feel that they're, they're, they're there's a lot of loneliness. Yeah. So 
Let's talk about social media a little bit more, um, which, as you know, has an outsized influence on tweens and teens. We've seen reports that teens and young adults are forming secret online communities to talk about eating disorders and crash diets, how to look skinny, ways to lose weight. Um, If social media contributes to eating disorders, what can parents do, especially when it's not realistic to take away devices, to lessen the impact? Sure. Um, And then I think that's a great conversation. Um, This is another, (laughs) we can't, it's hard to tackle everything, right? But this is a serious, serious issue. Um, So since the pandemic, you know, just a few statistics, since the pandemic, the use of screen time is up uh, about 17% for tweens and teens. Um, and there are just so everyone's aware, there are algorithms in our social media, the big tech, uh, companies that are targeting kids and tweens, uh, with eating disorder, pro eating disorder content. Um, and it's, and it's pretty serious. So yes, in social media influences them to have disordered eating thoughts, to want to be a certain look, uh, perfectionism, you know, it, 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 after looking at social media, this was the same with magazines years ago, people, individuals, kids feel worse about themselves and have lower self-esteem. It's all the comparison because they feel that, um, they're not good enough and there's something always better. Um, they're feeling left out. And they're, they're feeling like the world is, everybody's happier than I am. Um, and that's, of course, an illusion and delusional. And so I think that's important that we're getting messages about eating disorders, uh, pro eating disorders, just on their everyday Instagram, just on their everyday Snapchat, their advertising. Um, I think there's another app. There's always another app that the Be Real app, they're couching it. Uh, into being more authentic, but at the end of the day, it's about, um, you know, uh, looking a certain way or capturing uh, likes. Um, I have uh, one young person I w- I work with who is just obsessed with um, the number of likes that they get and wanting to be uh, perfect. And that certainly influences their eating disorder. So, uh, in terms of what can we do, I think they can certainly, you know, get on board with some of the acts that are on, uh, that are bills that we're trying to get passed. There's the Kids Online Safety Act. Um, there's another, um, I think it's called the, oh, I know it's called the Children and Teens Online Privacy Protection Act. Uh, we need to be talking to our Senates and get parents be, you know, be aware of the harmful content that their kids are looking at and they're being exposed to. It's dangerous. And I absolutely think we can absolutely reduce screen time and take away phones and limit what they're doing. Um, there's lots of apps that are, that could help. There's regulatories that you can help turn off their phones um, and get ask, access to them. Um, the phone is taken away at eight o'clock or the Wi-Fi is turned off, um, and and that's the the expectation and the structure you set at home. Um, but I don't think parents are aware of the dangers and the self harm glorification or the depression and glorifying the depression and people um, seeing that and feeling like that, and it just perpetuates um, those issues. Right. And the, and the secret communities that are online, oh, you know, they mm-hmm. have their own hashtags and their own language. Mm-hmm. So it's really difficult even for parents to, who are, you know, knowledgeable and go online. Uh, it's really difficult for them to find that their kids are in these secret communities. Um, so yes, it, just, it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's the inspiration. Oh yeah. They'll, oh, you know, I've, I'm sure everybody can relate, you know, you, you, you shut down their social media or you, and then they find a secret Instagram, you know, they build a fake Instagram and then they have their real Instagram and then they have their personal Instagram. I mean, it's, it's crazy. So so yes, I do know, but there are secret groups out there that are Mm -hmm. couching themselves or 
uh, masking themselves as being uh, body aware, body positive, and they're really inspirations or their ways to lose weight or their ways to self-harm and not get away with it. These are real things that are happening. And, uh, you know, it's, it's hard. Like I can, you know, I have my, own, I've had my own struggles, but, you know, taking away phones, making, you know, if you're paying for the phone, I feel like you have access to the phone. Um, and that's the rules that I can look at your phone at any time and seeing what you're doing. They have ways of hiding it though. The most important thing is, you know, how do we sit down and talk? You know, it's, it's a real conversation with our, our kiddos um, about being aware of these stressors and being aware of how it makes them feel. Um, and do we really want to feel like that after we're engaging in these groups and these talks? It's a whole relate. It's a whole conversation about um, relationships and toxic versus healthy um, when it comes to social media and when it comes to their friends too. Um, so, how can parents um, have these conversations without judgment or without blame? Like, maybe you could help us um, with some script, okay. you know, to to start the conversation so that it doesn't sound, you know, judgmental. Right, judgmental or yes. That's a great question Um, because, you know, we don't want to come off at, like you said, judgmental or punitive or, you know, um, mad. Um, It really comes from a place of, you know, I want to help understand, you know, what is going on. Just a real open heart. And this is hard to do, right? Because you want to, your fear comes forward, right? Your, your worry, your um, anger might come forward and they, they may feel that. So really trying to like, you know, balance yourself and then go into the conversation of saying, you know, let, you know, you know, help me, you know, just really understand, you know, how, how these friends may be influencing you or, you know, what are, how can social media, like I've been learning a lot about how social media can impact um, mood or eating issues and really just, you know, coming from an open place of wanting to understand and then really listening, you know, you know, trying to hold back the judgment and the uh, wanting to fix it. Um, I always kind of come from a place of trying to validate what they're feeling and by, by identifying three ways to validate, like, wow, that must be really difficult. must be really sad because you really counted on that friend and, and it sounds like she upset you and you really value that friendship. So you, you think of like three ways to validate Um, your loved one in these conversations. Um, But really just, you know, opening up and, you know, sometimes in the car, finding that right place. Like sometimes I have them trapped in the car. That's an awesome place to sometimes talk about these sensitive uh, issues. Laying down at night because that's a more vulnerable time. They're winding down and, you know, being able to say, you know, I've noticed, you know, that you've, you know, maybe, um, that you're, you know, might be eating when you're bored or that you've been upset more, that you haven't been eating as much. And I'm really worried about you. It's coming from a place of concern and support. How can, how can I support you and understand a little more about what's going on so that we can talk about it? It's hard because shame comes up, um, pain comes up and it's, it's continuing to come from that place of, I want to be able to support you and you're not doing anything wrong. Um, I just want to be able to help you and get the help you need. Mm -hmm. That's most important. They're not doing anything wrong because Mm -hmm. they don't know. We want to really just, you know, um, like I said, food and weight and body and, um, Appetite and satiation is so complicated. So um, it's not just about being disciplined or about, you know, um, 
you know, listening to my hunger, fullness cues, all that, especially with ADHD is, 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 is complicated. Mm -hmm. Um, We had a few questions around how to talk to children about their body imaging. So for example, one mom said, what do I say to my child when she says I'm fat and you know she could benefit from losing a few pounds, but you don't want to cause her to become body conscious. You want her to be healthy, of course. Um, so um, so how do you talk to a child who might be overweight, um, but you don't want them to think that they need to be skinny? Right. And I think that's a great question because I want to... Um, I, I want to just kind of look at the focus on weight, um, and you know, the, the, you know, the, the child is saying I'm feeling fat, or maybe the do- the mom is thinking, oh, there might be a weight issue. Um, and that's where I kind of want to shift the culture a little bit, um, and take it off the number and the weight and more about, um, relationship with food and behavioral patterns and movement uh, and, 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 and stress management. So the goal would not be focused on the weight. And of course, this is the first thing that doctors do, right? Oh, they're over there. Um, they're, they're, they'll give you a BMI, which we could do a whole hour on BMI and, and the, the things that are wrong with it. Um, but they'll give a BMI and say you're in this category and maybe in the you know, overweight or weight. And we really want to take the focus off numbers and weight and more on balance, variety, and moderation, right? And let the weight fall where it is. A lot of times it's our parents that might be more concerned about their child's weight than the child being concerned about their weight. Maybe. Um, but the child is only going to be concerned about their weight if they're hearing it from outside people, um, or the, in, in, and they're comparing and they're getting valued because they're seeing others being valued for being smaller and thinner. So there's a lot of messaging about that. And I can't emphasize enough that we don't want to focus on weight, um, and the number on the scale. We want to focus on eating balanced moving our bodies for the joy of moving our bodies, our self-esteem uh, and, and and not comparing that their bodies come in all different size and shapes. Uh, and it's a real culture shift. And it's so when if my daughter said, you know, I'm feeling fat, I want to lose weight. Um, I would really, you know, caution and say, let's not focus on the weight, honey. Let's focus on like eating and balance and, and focusing on moving our bodies. And then in your head, you're kind of seeing, okay, where, how can I help her get more structured and more balanced? Um, in if she needs that, if they need that. Um, otherwise, we really talk about being healthy in our bodies um, at all different types of sizes. Everybody comes in all different. There's a great um, book. Oh, Kathy Cater. Um, uh is it children come in all bodies or uh, I think it's children come in all sizes and shapes or all bodies, but it's a great workbook. Um, Kathy Cater, look her up. She will, she be a good resource um, to help with these types of um, these struggles. It's, it, it's a, it's a huge shift to talk about eating healthfully versus losing weight because yes, yes. Lose on weight. I mean, really from mm-hmm. the time, a child is at the pediatrician's office and they're, and they're mm-hmm. judged against other children in terms of their development. So it's, it's, and it stays that way, you know, it's, yeah. um, so it'd be a huge shift in thinking. It about. is a huge shift and mm-hmm. it's, but if we focused on a healthy relationship with food, I mean, I'm making it sound easy. I know it's not easy, but if we focused on a healthy relationship with our bodies, um, movement, um, and food and not focus on the weight. We're getting, we're too weight and there's arbitrary weights that we don't even know, you know, how do how, really, or if we're going to use a BMI scale or even a growth chart, um, sometimes we, it's arbitrary to what the body needs. And that's why I say BMI is a big problem. Um, 
a lot of our athletes, because of their muscle mass, might be in the quote unquote obese section. Um, and that's really not accurately reflecting who they are as an athlete and who what their muscle mass is and what their weight is. So we really, there's a lot of problems with using those measures. Um, and I, I really urge people, shift the culture. Don't talk about your own bodies. Don't talk about others' bodies. Don't be judgmental toward others in the way they look. Your children are listening. Um, and if you talk about yourself, then they're going to say, well, I look like my dad. So then, or mom, whatever. Right. And therefore I must be, you know, if they think they're fat, they're going to think I'm, I must be fat. Cause I look a lot like my parents or, <laughs> so the messages are really important to shift and, um, again, get back to what's really important, the inner values. And all of what I'm saying, I know is countercultural. Like, I know this is countercultural, um, but this is, um, we're at a serious, we're, we're in a serious situation here with our, with our kids' difficulties with resiliency, low self-esteem, and low self-worth. So we, we, we've got to do something different. Mm -hmm. Um, exercise can figure prominently in teens and tweens with eating disorders. So mm -hmm. can you share some strategies for setting boundaries around exercise that you've used in treatment, especially when exercise is part of a person's identity? That is a great question. So yes, it can be definitely, it can be a stress releaser and definitely an anxiety um, reducer. And it has to be with moderation, like, like I was talking about earlier. When exercise gets to a point of, it feels like, the, again, we're looking at intent behind it. It feels like I have to do it. I'm doing it at the expense of my, my sleep, you know, my time. Um, it's causing significant uh, issues with my um, relationships, uh, which I see a lot. Like, you know, people will exercise at the expense of spending time with their families or um, some people who are so uh, example of if you're on vacation and everybody has to wait until, you know, because they, they have to. It's all about the, the feeling of I have to. And the other part is perhaps there's stress fractures or there's stress on the body um, and there's a lot of injuries. So all of these together um, can be a factor. A lot of people are, are having osteoporosis or osteopenia. And, and so it really is compromising their body. Those are the factors that lead to the fact that exercise is becoming unhealthy and there's no joy in it. Um, that's why I like to use movement a lot you know, moving your body, but a lot of people, yes, they're, they're, they get, it, it's about anything, right. When on that dimension of over-involved, under-involved or over-controlled and under-controlled, we're trying to get more to the middle so that exercise isn't a part, like I could leave it be for a little bit because I'm on vacation with my family and we're doing activities. Uh, it doesn't feel like I have to be. Um, but when it's overtaking, um, I think it def definitely causes more harm than good. It actually increases cortisol and stress and actually could be you know, more harmful to the body if it's, if it's not done um, in balance. Mm -hmm. um, now there's those who don't move their body and don't exercise for many reasons. And I think that again is on the other end of the continuum where we don't have to go to the gym and walk, you know, 45 minutes or run 45 minutes on the treadmill to be a quote unquote exercise. There's so many different ways to move their body um, and feel good in their body, playing Frisbee outside, taking a walk, um, doing just dance, or is that, I think that's still a thing on we, um, or, um, uh, you know, throwing the football around, just, just different things to engage, you know, um, your body to feel good and, and being moving. So I think we have to get those definitions of what exercises, exercise constitutes out of our head and get back into trying to just get our bodies going. Yeah. Um, so I have a few friends whose daughters compulsively exercise, mm -hmm. um, particularly if they've eaten, you know, birthday cake at a friend's house. Or um, so 
is there a way to to talk about the uh, obsessive um, mm-hmm. part of exercising to lose weight or to not gain weight? So those are the rules. So those that's a rule around calories in, calories out, mm-hmm. right? So that becomes focused on I have to deserve or earn uh, eating. And so it becomes an issue just in that sense. Like I have to deserve to eat this cake or I have to earn it by exercising or, you know, the calories off. So that's kind of where it gets a little disordered, Mm -hmm. disordered because why can I just have a piece of cake because it's somebody's birthday? Why do I have to feel like I have to earn it or work it off? Mm -hmm. Um, so there's, there's that mentality around it instead of, again, enjoying exercise for exercise because you want to be healthy and it's good for your heart and it's good for your stress and it's good for your body and your muscles. Um, not because I'm eating a food that is bad and we don't, that's another issue I didn't mention. We want, and maybe we'll talk about that next time, right? Um, nutrition of, of having food food be food and not labeling it good or bad. Because as soon as we have that quote unquote bad chocolate cake, then the internalization of I'm bad and I have to earn, I have to work it off becomes a cycle. Um, And that's where the relationship with food becomes uh, skewed or distorted or basically dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, one listener asks, does not being diagnosed with ADHD and eating disorders as a child make it likely that a person will carry these symptoms into adulthood? Um, not, I don't think necessarily. Um, I think that, you know, like I said, sooner the better to be treated and address these issues because there's... Um, uh, you know, I, I, people get better from eating disorders. Um, people certainly improve from ADHD. There's, I think, different times in their lives where they're stressed and they, you know, are different developmental periods in their life, transitions particularly, where they feel more stressed and those symptoms, that way of coping may rear its ugly head, like the eating disorder. So we have to um, be uh, proactive and have preventative measures of taking care of your body. Um, but I certainly absolutely believe and seen it for myself that people get better, um, and can recover from eating disorders. And with ADHD, I certainly think that they can learn compensatory skills and their brain develops, uh, as they grow older and they can learn different ways to cope. Um, so I definitely think there's hope as, as someone gets better if they they work it and realize uh, that they have to work on these issues. Um, this is an interesting question. Um, do you have advice for parents with ADHD who are struggling with eating disorders themselves and who have children with ADHD and they don't want to pass these this eating disorder onto them? As- oh, I love I yeah. Yes. Yeah, I love that they're being they such a, a a desire, right? I don't I don't want to pass these. Just exactly kind of what I've been talking about, changing the cultural shift in the family around food, um, learning other skills to cope instead of using food or avoiding food, um, and shifting about you know focusing on self care and focus on uh, that all bodies here. Uh, uh, come in all different shapes and and sizes. Um, But it's all those kind of those shifts that I was talking about, starting with you, right? Like um, not wanting to pass those on uh, because you don't, you want to change your mindset and your approach to food will help definitely change their mindset and their approach to food. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, we're out of time, but Dina, thank you so much for being here today and for sharing your expertise with our community. And to everyone listening, thank you for joining us. The replay of today's conversation will be available on attitudemag.com and we'll email all registrants once the recording is up. We've had many questions from listeners about the nutritional aspect of eating disorders and how to help teens and tweens eat healthfully. 
Solutions Are Coming in part two of this conversation with Dina, we will be joined by registered dietitian, Megan Niskern, and we will answer your questions and you'll love that their advice comes just before the Thanksgiving holiday. Join us for part two, how to encourage healthy eating in kids with eating disorders. We hope to see you then. Thank you. For more Attitude Podcast and information on living well with attention deficit, visit attitudemag.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G.com.